All right, y'all, welcome back to Coming to Arms channel. Okay, so today we're checking out something from the Royal Marines YouTube channel. Now, it's always really nice when they upload something because we already know the production quality is going to be outstanding. Now, this sounds pretty cool. So this is about counter piracy and pilot rescue. Now, I haven't done, some, I haven't done much counter piracy myself. I mean, the general infantry Marines aren't really so trained on that. I was trained on, you know, CQB inside of a ship. But counter piracy is kind of different. You need to understand the tactics and nuances that these guys would be implementing. So that's usually something I think like the Marine, the Marine Recon would implement or maybe like the VBSS team on the, on the Marine Expeditionary Unit or the Amphibious Readiness Group. I think that's generally who would be doing it. But Pilot Rescue is something that we did a couple times called um, TRAP, Tactical Recovery of Aircraft and Personnel. Uh, but yeah, it was always a fun time, but again, very, very nuanced and you need to sort of plan for that specific nuanced mission. You can't just go into it not having any sort of prior planning or experience with it because it's going to be pretty rough. So I'm excited. I'm excited to see how the Royal Marines do it specifically. So let's go ahead and check it out. Oh yeah. The intelligence picture would always be the first part. What is this vessel? What is it carrying? Who's on board? What are they doing? Do we have jurisdiction here? If <laughs> yeah, jurisdiction's a big one. Actually, that's pretty interesting. I wonder how the Royal Marines sort of decide what their jurisdiction is. I mean, I imagine they probably just get an order from higher if they need to be implemented for something. For us, it's a little bit more cut and dry, I feel like, because usually it's stuff that we would do when we're forward deployed, because otherwise you have a bunch of other agencies that would do it, like Coast Guard or you know someone in, in Homeland Security. But yeah, I kind of wonder how the Royal Marines, like such a, a military unit, would get primacy for these sort of operations jurisdiction and we do have a reason to board how do we think we're going to conduct that where do we think our points of access are oh man the gear is so primary sick secondary point. so primary hook on point is going to be the port and starboard side we want them that is our primary to get both of them at the same time uh, as soon as that foothold hmm. has been established we're going to blow past via the port side as a team as a troop start moving all the way down to the bowels of the ship from that point onwards hmm. in 19 Okay, so they're doing like a multi-team hit. They're attacking it from both sides, which is kind of cool. Um, I imagine they, they're going to offset slightly just so they're not like worried about firing on each other or what have you. But maybe that's not really a thing because they could honestly, depending on how tall the ship is, they can just push up a security boat and they can kind of cover, you know, where that foothold would actually be once they actually get up. So they might not have to offset or anything. On board, we're looking at four suspected enemy personnel on board. Okay, so... Four crew members or four people on board and then four baddies. But 19 is a lot of people to have to worry about, get accountability of. But four dudes, that should be pretty easy for them. Dude, doing this, they're not even using the night vision at this point. Looks like there might be enough ambient lighting. In a bold operation in the dead of night, the Royal Marines honed in on an Iranian oil tanker. <laughs> Navy sailors have seized 680 kilos of cocaine worth 100 million pounds on board a speedboat in the Caribbean Sea. Sailors and Marines from the ship joined other NATO vessels to intercept a dow off the Somali coast. Okay, oh together. yeah. The haul is quite something. 212 bales of cocaine. <laughs> bales. <laughs> Holy cow. Hell yeah, Porto Commando, man. It's a place to be. Do you need to be like a particularly good swimmer to be in 4-2 Commando? Because I know, you know, with our MSRT, our Coast Guard MSRT, or even Marine Recon or, or MARSOC, you need to be pretty good at swimming because, you know, they work on the water a little bit more than the normal infantry Marines. So I wonder if these guys have their own sort of like selection process or if they pick like some of the strongest swimmers in training, um, I kind of wonder how that is. So if there's any particular se selection process for 4-2 Commando, definitely let me know down in the comment section. Uh, I'm liking the Team Wendy. I think it's, yeah, Team Wendy helmets, bump helmets. Oh man. Do they have flashlights? There is a point during a boarding operation hmm. where everything's gone quiet, you're operating from a small boat, you're trying to get onto a super tanker, hoping <laughs> that you don't get identified by the enemy. Yeah, the adrenaline. And you reach out and you grab a caving ladder to then pull yourself to the top. 
And when you get to the top, you're then into a potential combat situation. Yeah, for real. It's I feel like it'd be like multiple stages of sort of like adrenaline dumps because like you're gearing up and then leaving the ship, you know, not too crazy. But as you're approaching that, that, you know, I guess enemy vessel or that affected vessel at that point is one thing, but then you get the ladder and then, you know, you're lining up to get up to the ladder and then that, then you're actually climbing it. And then like he was saying, you're actually getting onto the vessel. So yeah, it's like tears of, of stress almost added to it. Phenomenally difficult. It's genuinely intimidating that moment, that transition from your craft to the ladder on their craft, it's probably the most sort of exhilarating part of the, the role. <laughs> it has its dangers. Uh, it is inherently a dangerous task, especially at night in a high sea state. There is a threat there. Hmm. Boarding a ship underway, particularly at night, is one of the most dangerous things we do. So I'm kind of wondering, I know for like, you know, vessels that aren't as tall, but this one's pretty freaking tall. So you can't really implement a security boat that would be that effective, at least for, you know, where the foothold area is. Uh, helicopter support would be nice, but I wonder kind of, I mean, now they're trying to do stealth. So helicopter is probably not going to be good. They're going to have to push the helicopter pretty far, but I'm guessing, you know, eventually they can get the helicopter on, or maybe, you know, they might just decide that the vessel is too tall. Maybe we should just fast rope in. I kind of wonder where the, the separation is with, you know, how they're deciding to insert, depending on like the, the size of the vessel and the intel that they get. The ship underway to get at night is one of the most dangerous things we do. Oh my gosh, look at that. So the ship's boarding operation will usually start in an intelligence phase or a collect phase. This is supported by usually a wildcat on station. Oh yeah. Uh, they'll provide imagery uh, that the commander conducts his estimate on and then brief the captain of the ship. The boarding team will embark the packs and approach the vessel. We'll conduct our, our recce, or depending on the threats, uh, we'll either move straight onto target uh, or we'll stand back providing fire support. Okay. Once the team are on board, the, the main effort is to get that tactical foothold on board the shipping platform yep. to then clear through and conduct the rest of the operation. Oh, who's that? Oh, okay, never mind. I thought that was a different dude. Yeah, so some of these guys, so he's a Royal Marine. This does not look like a Royal Marine, though, to be honest. I see a different emblem there. If you guys know who this is, definitely let me know because it didn't say in the description. And they're using a different weapon and they just... I mean, the, the black on black, that's not something you, I mean, you will see the dry suits and what have you, but this is, yeah, this is like a police or something almost. The operation. So in order to facilitate us getting into that maritime environment, 4-7 Command, they provide the boats, the coxswains, and the expertise huh. for actually getting alongside and the, the driving skill oh, to yeah. allow our guys to do that dangerous transition from their craft to the ladder. I never heard of 4-7 Commando. Always take a wildcat helicopter with a maritime sniper attached and that's not go. necessarily always to act as a sniper often their skill set as observers is as valuable if not more valuable than the uh, sort of firearms protection that they mm. can offer for sure an elite soldier has to have an elite level of discipline everybody has to understand that when they're dealing with Royal Marines from 4-2 Command, though, so cool. they're dealing with absolute professionals who will deliver against the task that they've been given every time. So 4-2 Commando delivers maritime security operations, maritime interdiction operations, mm -hmm. we conduct support and influence operations, and joint personnel recovery for Commando forces. Okay, so I'm guessing when they're like forward deployed, that's kind of where they get their jurisdiction. Um, they're not necessarily, I guess they're not really necessarily called upon if there is something that's happening off the shore. I mean, we've seen it before where the SBS responded to, to situations like that, but I'm guessing these guys kind of support in more of like a NATO role when they're forward deployed and there's some sort of vessel that was, that was taken over in their AO. But I didn't know that they were responsible for the, um, joint personal recovery. So I imagine, yeah, like they're saying like the pilot rescue or the, there's trap mission. So that's kind of cool. I, I, would imagine, you know, any commando elements is probably pretty decent at that. But it is nice when you have like these specific roles assigned to you because you can really train and get into the mindset of doing those specific roles. Obviously, every operational environment has its own specific or unique challenges. Uh, maritime environment is no different. Obviously, you have to adjust 
some of hmm. the ways that we work and some of the kit and equipment we use. A short barrel weapon system because you're moving in a confined space. Absolutely. Uh, an ambidextrous weapon system because you, you need to be able to manipulate your weapon far more in that confined space. Body armor's been made buoyant so that if anybody does fall off or fall okay. in, they're protected. Helmets nice. are different because a conventional helmet, if you were to fall off and hit the water, will act as a sort of sea break or an anchor and do huge damage to the neck and spine. So you have to have a helmet. Oh, that is so interesting. Okay, I didn't think about like, think about it like that. I mean, I understand like if you, you have a ballistic helmet, it's a lot heavier and you don't really want weight on you when you're in the water like that. But yeah, okay. I mean, I guess that makes sense, especially with the bump helmet, it has holes. Maybe it wouldn't hit the water as hard or maybe it would kind of like disperse some of that. Again, it's always nice when you can get the like the professional opinion of sort of why they're explaining it because that's something that I've noticed. But again, if somebody hasn't really explained, I can just make an educated guess as to why they use certain things. Helmet that can allow for that risk. What is this? Damn, look at this shady looking area. The Royal Marine Boarding Course is a nine week course focusing on level two and level three operations. We conduct close quarter marksmanship training, okay. vessel access, including low vertical access and high vertical access. We also touch nice. on methods of insertion such as fast roping and then the exploitation of a target vessel. Nice, dude. That's so freaking sick. Yeah, EOTech is a good move for, for that Dr. environment too. operations, you're generally working in small teams and you're disaggregated from your command back in the UK. That presents its own issues as a commander. Mm. There has to be a level of trust put in the individuals who are forward delivering in these complicated situations. Divorced from their normal chains of command, supporting unusual constructs all over the world, <laughs> they're required to use their ingenuity, they're required to use their own integrity, they've got to have a strong moral and ethical basis, and at the same time, they have to be good at their <laughs> Well said. Yeah, so that's something that we kind of try and preach upon here in the, in the U.S. military is mission command. Basically, allowing your subordinate leaders to be able to, you know, have that trust and confidence to get a general sort of end state as to what the higher echelon commanders want and, you know, facilitating the operations in order to meet that and not necessarily being fixed into a certain rigid path and having such narrow has, having such a narrow lane to actually go and accomplish that. And it's nice when you have that trust so you can have that flexibility. But again, you need to understand that you need to sort of earn that trust. Otherwise, you know, operation can get sloppy or things can kind of be put on the news and it's not going to look too great for your organization. You need commandos doing this because they are trained to such a high level that they can be trusted to deploy and deliver what the government of the United Kingdom and the fleet requires. Hmm. Oh, damn, that looks sick. Oh, Iceland. Oh, man, that's gnarly then. So I guess this is the pilot rescue portion. It could be an isolated personnel from a patrol that's gone missing. It could be, for instance, an aircraft that has gone down. And we know where it is, um, but we need to go in and recover it. Hmm. Joint personnel recovery is the tactical recovery of aircraft personnel and sensitive equipment. We're off the coast of Iceland on the USS Arlington. Oh, and we're yeah. working with the 22nd Marine Expeditionary Unit. Yep, there we go. Uh, America's specialist trap teams, the JPR experts. So we're here to learn off them and help make ourselves an even more credible JPR force. <laughs> Man, that terrain. So the worst case scenario <laughs> in a, a JPR situation, deep behind enemy lines, the isolated person or sensitive piece of equipment has been captured or the enemy forces are enclosing on it. It will be a mm. contested environment to get the person or piece of equipment back. Yeah, it's such a tricky thing because it is very, very time sensitive, but you need solid intel so you're not going to the wrong area. And at the same time, you need a big enough force so you can sort of, you know, hold yourself off if there is an enemy presence, but also not too big to where you obviously you showcase so much, especially if they didn't know the aircraft was there, but you showcase so much and it's also too hard or it takes a lot longer to actually egress. So it's definitely a weird balancing act. And training this in Iceland is an interesting one. Again, it's like the gnarly terrain makes it a little bit more realistic, I guess, because, I mean, you never know. You can never plan for where an aircraft is going to go down. So it's nice that they're training on this pretty rough and challenging terrain. 
which obviously makes it a lot harder, especially in an extreme weather environment. <laughs> because as soon as I get on the ground, I need to be looking for the isolated personnel because he could have moved, he could have been captured. So we'll be looking out for any signs on the ground, any evidence, pieces of kit that have been left behind, and yep. looking out for any enemy threats. How'd they get the plane there? So though? one of the main dangers, especially out in these extreme environments, is the weather. It can change in a matter of minutes. For example, so cool. the pilot's been shot down. All they've got is their flight suit. They're not going to survive very long. We need to yep. get in there and get them out. With the introduction of both the carriers, the Prince of Wales and the Queen Elizabeth, the F-35 jet is a very top secret piece of kit and equipment. Hmm. So the so what of why we need that capability is because if an aircraft was to be shot down in a hostile environment, a hostile territory, where potentially some of our key adversaries could get their hands on this bit of equipment, they could turn the tides and turn the tables hmm. for future or potential future conflicts. And that's a whole nother thing, making sure you're avoiding the compromise of this, you know, very, very critical information and equipment, you know, whether it be like specific communications equipment or like the actual aircraft itself, especially the F-35 being so new. If somebody were to get like, you know, components or like the blueprints of it, then obviously they're going to be able to reverse engineer it and that's not gonna be a good time. When we're trying to modernize and whatnot, and then you have other countries that are kind of able to, you know, pace with us or kind of undermine what we've been modernizing, then it, you know, it's a lot of taxpayers' money out the window. But at the end of the day, it's going to be a lot of lives that could be potentially lost because of this information got into the wrong hands. By working alongside our key allies and key partners like the US, it means that we can come in to complete synergy when we operate together. We then have this potent hmm. and formidable force that gives both the UK and our allies the confidence to operate in areas knowing that they've got a joint coalition force that can come in and pull them out and recover them if something goes wrong. Oh yeah, that is a nice reassurance for sure. It's kind of cool they got the to do that in big Iceland. The idea at the heart of FCF is a persistent presence forward across the world. Commandos delivering on behalf of defense globally. Commandos from 4-2 Commando are spread across the fleet, delivering boarding ops that see us providing counter narcotics, counter piracy, <laughs> and a range of other outputs directly for the Royal Navy on behalf of uh, defense and the UK prosperity agenda. UK it's prosperity a agenda. It's a complex array of outputs that we deliver. Um, it's an exciting time to be part of this unit. Oh, that's a sick shot right there. Especially if somebody was fast roping. <laughs> I'm liking the night vision filter they put on this though. You can tell it's not really that dark for a lot of these shots because they're not even using the night vision. But it looks fantastic for the video. <laughs> yep, yeah, hell yeah. Split stack right there. Again, 4-2 Commando, 4-3 Commando, they definitely do CQB right. Nice. Oh yeah. Always some fantastic stuff. Especially I know I know James Clark. I've seen his Instagram. Great stuff there. Okay. Again, another great video. I really love these videos specifically because it really showcases the capabilities of each commando element that we're looking at. And this one, I like, it was more of like a 4-2 commando special, which is pretty cool because yeah, giving that much screen time to one specific commando element, again, sort of allows us to know a little bit more about what their challenges are, what their sort of operations look like, and again, what their you know kit is looking like. And of course, it does help when the quality of the video is this freaking sick because it really does hype you up. I mean, if I was thinking about joining the Royal Marines, or you know, I know somebody who's in the Royal Marines, and I see a video like this, then I would get super hyped up for either joining, you know, if I was on the fence, definitely joining, but also you know, being proud of knowing people who are actually in this sort of role or occupation because I mean, it's it's pretty badass and. Yeah, I mean, there's no sugarcoating that. It's just, these are some badass dudes doing some badass stuff. So yeah, thank you guys again for recommending this very cool video. I, I don't know, I'm, I, I am subscribed and I have notifications on, but 
again, sometimes I just don't get the notifications. And you guys sent me the video like five times within the first hour it was uploaded, which was awesome. So I knew about it and yeah, I reacted to it pretty much right away. But yeah, by the time this video goes out, it might be like maybe a month old <laughs> to be honest, cause uh, I'm recording a little bit ahead. And you guys will probably notice this, but for all of November and like the first half of December, there's only going to be two, maybe three videos a week because as I'm recording this, it's not November yet, but I'm going to be in training for like a month and a half. So I'm pre-recording stuff just so I can still have some videos. But you know, that's just the nature of being in the military. I mean, I'm so lucky I have enough time to plan for it because sometimes like deployments and whatnot, you don't really have that much, you know, of an advance notice. So I'll try and pre-record enough just so, you know, there are still some videos going out so you guys aren't missing the content too much. But thank you again for recommending this video. It was fantastic. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. That's it for this video. I'll see you on the next one.